I was actually with someone in the show today who looked at this piece and didn't recognize that it was a seesaw until I, until I started moving it and watching <laughs> these hands that are still until you move it. But I mean, these, every single piece here has both stillness and movement in it and thinking about apathy and thinking about your parents. And, but we're just going to stay still until we have to move. <laughs> and so what motivates stillness and movement and sonic meditation? And everyone thinks about meditation as being stillness when actually there's a lot of activity to it as well. So that was something I was thinking about as we were listening. Yeah. In a similar vein, I was thinking about cycles. Every piece has some kind of cycle involved in it, too. And that was really apparent. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I didn't know if I was, I didn't know about the really long waves and music at the end. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but I would. You know, everybody who knows me would be like, well, yeah, but like, I don't know, like, you know, invisibilia and, and, and just our whole world is so like, you know, it's just so much faster um, to just like sit um, and to have something be so repetitive. Like, I actually quite enjoyed listening to the way that the waves were so repetitive and the way that the music was so repetitive and just thinking about what it would have been like to be that musician and just like do that, you know, feels. Um, and I think that like, like I, you know, I, I don't have like a list of 10 things to do to like personally help stop climate change from happening. But, but I do think as those confrontations occur or, you know, as, as, everything gets more um, scarce, which it feels like it probably will, um, but that's when, like, trying to take pauses and to not just react and to, to take a minute to breathe and to think through things, um, you know, is going to become even more and more important. I think that also that sense of that presence, the presence of stillness and the presence of silence is when you can truly connect with somebody. Because you, you kind of, or, or a thing in front of you, or like a space or a place, um, like when you are still and you connect with your eyes, with your, like with your being, mm -hmm. like there's something that happens there that can motivate. Um, and I, I think like, I sp like millennials especially like feel really disconnected from everything. And I don't maybe even Gen Z, Gen Z uh, because of things we hold in our pockets. Like we're always connected, but that's not real connection. Um, and to just be still and be with somebody, to be with a place, is like such a deep spiritual connection that we so lack in our society right now. And I think there's going to be, I feel like there's already a backlash in terms of like slowing down yeah. and like just being. Um, and that's one thing I really, really loved about the beginning of this piece was just that unification between all of us. I don't know very many people here, but I felt unified. I felt like there was a collective thing going on in this space that carried through the entire piece. Um, and related to every single piece in here, and then like I just I don't know. There's something about the space right now, especially after the song meditation, and then your sound piece that really kind of unifies us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I really really enjoyed it. That pause for the silence at the end reminded me of the space between movements and. The symphony and the awkwardness, especially maybe among a non-musical crowd, we're like, oh, I just, 
<laughs> and then getting it, and then, okay, now we're all in the same space, right? And also made me think about dead air um, on a podcast, on the radio, that's such a bad thing. Yeah. Because you're not face to face with people, because you can't look people in the eye and be like, we're quiet on purpose now, right? Yeah. <laughs> I get slapped on the wrist. Like, wouldn't that be great just to have silence on oh, yeah. this? Oh, yeah. I, I went to go see Handel's Messiah at the mm -hmm. National Cathedral. Nice. And afterwards, I was like, I really liked the parts where it got quiet, and then you would just hear, like, hmm. And Ryan was like, you mean when they were tuning? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, <laughs> tuning. <laughs> My favorite part. <laughs> the humming was very similar to the tuning yes. as well. Right? The same though, or, or purposefully different. Well, yeah, you notice that everybody started totally separate and then it ended with the collect, like a unification. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it seemed yeah. like. And oh, every we note. Make a tail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every note made sense. The, the law of resonance and this idea of kind of tuning how you tune an instrument is you have to put something to it. When you tune a piano, that which tunes it is in harmony, and that and you're absolutely right. And the law of resonance states that you become in harm, harmony with that which is in harmony. That's why it's so important to get around nature because nature is in perfect harmony. Our destruction of it is a whole other discussion, <laughs> but to get in the presence of nature is because it has a resonance. Like water and waves have a resonance. And just like listening to the water together and hearing the story of your parents. But yet, like on a personal level, like you, I remember my interaction with the water of that piece mm -hmm. and how it felt in me. Mm -hmm. The story is a very brainy experience where the music or the sound of the waves were like, oh, you know, I asked myself, like, could I listen to this for my entire life? If I love, if I live by the water, yeah. that would be my silence. Right. That's my silence. Right. Like, would I be cool with that? Yes. Or do I want to hear that hum? Right. right. Mm -hmm. These guys were in a resonant frequency with the the uh, audio as well, <laughs> almost perfectly. It was. It was kind of amazing. I kept waiting for it to go a little off. It was like, no, it's still Interesting. <laughs> Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine recently accidentally asked her Alexa she was requesting a song, but Alexa misunderstood and defined music instead. <laughs> so music is, I can't do the Alexa voice, but music is uh, the combination of sound and silences. And I never heard, I've never thought about it that way before, that the silences in between the notes are just as important. Like those pauses are what make it music in the first place. Yes. I was thinking about that when we were humming. Without the silence, you have just sound. Just sound, yeah. And if you think about that visually, too, not just auditorily. Like, yeah. <laughs> or even just like how we interact with the world. Mm -hmm. like what is a silent vision? And what can that do? Like, what are the spaces between what we see? Like the silence between notes. I'm not looking for an answer, but I don't know. I'm just trying to make, just mm -hmm. thinking about a comparison. So you recorded your parents and the waves at the same time? And then someone played a guitar or a bass? I'm not even sure what that was. 
You know, it sounded to me like a guitar. So those three things. No, I I I actually um, I recorded about ten hours of tape, um, which was too much. Um, you didn't subject us to it, so I, <laughs> I subjected myself. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I interviewed my parents and my brother, and I interviewed uh, Mark, who uh, is the director of the National Oceanic, Florida Oceanographic Society, um, and and then I interviewed just people around the island as residents, um, and then I recorded um, the sounds around the island. So. I recorded the ocean. I recorded the the water in in the um, um, whatever a, a, a boatyard is called um, marina. marina. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, and 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 at the rec hall, there's like a pool and um, and then a, a music an, an instrument. That is from um, the Free Music Archive, um, and it's a piece that I've used in a lot of my pieces. Why? I think it's Chris Zabriskie. I don't know why. Um, I don't know. I like it. I don't know. Because so, yeah. it's, um, yeah. it's a Yeah, it was a guitar playing four notes. C E G A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emotionally neutral. Right. Right. Not trying to steer you too hard. Yeah. And the and the animals. Birds. Yeah. Yeah. Osprey. Osprey, kingfisher. Seagulls. There's a lot of wildlife in the backyard. Um, they're back. My dad designed the house, and it has um, this like little coffee nook on the second floor that's just like a little porch, and um, and and it just looks out over a couple mangroves, and then the the estuary is back there. So um, you know, there's manatee and there are sharks and dolphins and stingray and all kinds of fish and um, all kinds of birds. Every once in a while there's a ski do. <laughs> definitely felt very teared down and kind of minimal. Yeah. Um, art, artists, art historians in the room. Is that part of minimalism, that like tearing down and like the idea of silence or pause or John Cage? Yeah. <laughs> Did you say John Cage? Yeah. What am I? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. John Cage famously composed a piece, three minutes and 33 seconds, that yeah. is nothing but silence. It's, uh, the performer sits down at the piano and plays three minutes and 33 seconds of silence. And the idea is, as Monroe is kind of talking about this, is what is the space in between? Well, there's actually a lot of noise and you become aware of your surroundings. surroundings and you know, you can get into all of color theory and what is white, but a combination of all of the colors, and it's just, is there actually empty space or silence? And when did minimalism really rise? When, when was it? Sixties. So also a very tall <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Another similarity between minimalism and the show and your piece, I think, is that um, emotional 
distance, or at least trying not to be, as you were saying, guide. Did you use more guiding or pushing or something? Not trying to push the viewer too clearly into one emotional space or another, even though the message behind it might actually be emotional. Like it could, if you pay attention, cause it could cause sadness or anger or joy in some cases too. I do feel like there's different types of minimalism too. Like Donald Judd is like the industrial minimalist. It has no emotional or feeling connotations to it. And he's like this this masculine like sculptor guy who like, no, it's just material. And it's like, this is what it looks like into its most pared down form. And these are these phenomena that happen. And then you have someone like Ann Truitt who was uh, another minimalist uh, who builds these columns of color. And each column uh, for her comes from a specific like emotional or like uh, time in her life or a memory or a feeling that she had. Maybe it was this column of color represents like her sitting by a waterfall. So and it's just this this cube of, of beautiful color that's been layered and layered and layered and layered with paint so it glows and it lifts. Uh, and and so there's two very different types of minimalism. I mean, maybe, there's more than two probably. <laughs> but there are these different sides of minimalism that that like through the paring of down or through like through the silence you can get to these very different and really interesting avenues. I was struck by um, <clears throat> artworks are silent most of the time, you know, and so we were sitting here in silence with the silent artworks. And there was, I mean, just, I never really think about that. <laughs> that these artworks are sitting here for the duration of the show, patiently waiting for people to come and walk around. And here we came, sat down, and were silent with them. So, you know, I wonder what they think. <laughs> of tape and um, and I, I for an invisibilia piece I'm working on I built um, I built a tornado in sound and um, I potentially have done some damage I think um, I mean I've been producing audio I've spent probably the last maybe nine years of my life pretty consistently inside of headphones and I I've noticed within the last year and a half that I have tinnitus like pretty regularly, and um, today when I was trying to edit, I, c I like couldn't totally hear what I was working on. And I remembered when I was editing the waves, there was a very specific way in which I held the microphone so that you didn't just hear the wave coming in, but you could hear the way that the water seeped into the sand. And it was beautiful. It was a really beautiful sound. And um, that's also John Cage, you know, love sounds. And I love sounds. I love sounds. And that's probably why I ended up in the line of work that I'm in. And um, it made me sad to be sitting there. And, and I, you know, it's, it's because of the speakers. Like, it's not because I'm going deaf right now. But, I don't think, but like the the you know you you lose something when you listen through a speaker than when you listen inside of headphones, and I couldn't hear the water seeping into the sand, and it made me think about like my own future in which like even inside of headphones I'm not going to be able to hear the water seeping into the sand, and and um, and that is is frightening and sad. And it made me like appreciate just listening to the to the waves. To be able to touch it, though. Yeah. <laughs> right. And yeah. It. And I've never been a a, a, a music maker, mm -hmm. um, which is part of the reason I like sonic meditations because it's, you know, my dad has always told me I'm tone deaf, and fortunately with sonic meditations, it, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And how would that dad? <coughs> and so, uh, so yeah, that was actually the thought I had was, well, maybe I'll just, I'll start making more noises. Because <laughs> I won't be able to hear them. <laughs> I think that's 
a profound place to stop. <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Yeah, all of you.